Mm-hmm. What we're not doing is saying like, hey, Monster, you know, like, hey, we're, we're drilling down into affiliates. We're not getting, you know, they're, a lot of partners are not involved in our education material and stuff. That's kind of like holy territory, like the level one and level two. I think never that's the concern be that people that. have. They're like, hey, well, yeah. Coke owns Monster and like, we know how this has gone for the past 10 years. Like, is this the beginning of the end with regard to, you know, letting some of these people in the space? Yeah. Welcome to the Best Hour of Their Day podcast with your hosts, Jason Fernandez. And me, Jason Ackerman. With more than 20 years in the business. As both coaches and affiliate owners. Our passion is to help create world-class affiliates. And coaches by building better boxes. boxes. Welcome to the Best Hour of Your Day. Welcome back to Best Hour of Their Day, Fern Ackerman, special guest, the GM of sport. For CrossFit, yeah. Is it for CrossFit? Yeah. yeah. All right. Of the world. Of the world. No, of all of, sports? Of just of sport, okay. yeah. right. Justin sure. Berg. <laughs> but that's a, that, that in and of itself is a title that's changed, right? I think in the past it's been the GM of the CrossFit Games, and now it's sport as a whole within the CrossFit world. What's changed there? Um, I think with the recent acquisition, there was a lot of focus on really figuring out how do we drill down on the gym business, as one separate thing, and then also the education business. Make sure that, and that education business is so rock solid with Nicole, uh, but bringing in Gary to really take the affiliate group further. And then sport was kind of the, the third bucket. And I like this because there was a, hey, the games are one thing, and it leads to an event. So I like the notion of referring to sport as something more broad, and also that isn't just for the fittest people on earth. So Yeah, I do want to talk about that because we were chatting before, and and you guys are trying to expand that bucket a little bit and make yeah. it a little bit more accessible. But I think it's worth noting, like, been in the CrossFit community for a long time, former affiliate owner, worn the red shirt a little bit. So yeah. Flowmaster. It's not, it's not, not a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's, not, it's not just your, – your, your swim lane is not just sport. Like, you've, you've come up through the ranks. Yeah, I, I was lucky. A long time ago, I had a career in sports technology, and I was traveling around to PGA Tour golf tournaments, and I would drop into affiliates. And so I dropped into, like, Pat's Gym in Virginia Beach yep. a million years ago. I yep. dropped in at GSX CrossFit in, you know, Texas. Yep. I dropped into Miami. Tucker, you know, that's Tucker. That's, that's old right. School, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I saw these, old, uh, these, like, you know, people that were, like, early figures. I dropped into um, Dublin, Ohio, or it may have been Gahana, and met Bill Henniger when he oh, was man. working for somebody else, going to grad school, and he's like, man, I'd love to make American-made equipment. Um, for fitness. I'd love to take out the middleman. Well, you're like, there's no business there, Bill. What are you talking <laughs> yeah, about? Yeah, that's a terrible no, idea. And, you shouldn't and, do that. And he and Katie, they took me out for wings afterwards, and I ended up buying all my equipment at CrossFit Southside from them. So, uh, but I was doing that, and I dropped into gyms. I took the level one course, and it changed my life. So I'm like, this is it. Like, I'm doing the wrong thing. Like, sports tech wasn't it. And Where did you I, take your level one? I took my level one at uh, CrossFit BGI. And an interesting Maryland. story. No, BGI in, no, BGI's in, in, in Florida. Florida. Yeah. Oh, okay. In Florida. Oh, that was Jenny's gym. You're thinking BWI. Yes. BGI, yeah. you're right. And, uh, and at that point, I didn't realize this, but, you know, Greg was primarily doing the seminars, and he was the guy. But this was one of the early groups where it was like Dave Castro and Andy Stumpf, Johnny Mack, and others were kind of splitting off, and they were doing, you know, separate seminars on the same weekend. And so I got to see kind of the transition from, like, Greg being the sole guy everything was around him to, hey, there's now another camp of people, and so we can bring the message to more people. And so I happen to be at one of those. Sometimes it's just timing, right? So that's yeah. the right place, right, right time. Place, right 2007, time. Yeah. eight ish Yeah, so that was the beginning of 2008. Yeah, and then okay. you got on staff. You, you were a flow master, correct? I was. Do you, you know, I think one thing people forget is it's kind of like being an affiliate owner. I do it because I love coaching. Then yeah. you're an affiliate owner, and you're like, I don't get to coach anymore. Or maybe I don't have to. I have right. to do on There's other that. things. You must have went through that. Because to be a flow master, you must love being on seminars. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you're like, I don't get to do this thing I love. And maybe now you do love this other career path. But did you miss the training aspect? I missed being on seminar staff the most. For me personally, like by nature, I'm a student. And when I went to my first level one, I was like, the command that those people have delivering that material and also like the swagger, like not only is it accurate, it's like, and it's cool. Like they know what they're talking about. This is simple. They bury it deep in your brain. And I remember going, I would love to have that type of command of that material. And then also, you know, transfer forward, you're like, how much impact that has on other people's lives. I'm like, I just want to be able to do it like they do. And I didn't know that that was Flowmaster or Lecturer. That wasn't even, I don't even know if they use those it terms back then. a thing at that right. point, yeah. But I was like, hey, that would be what good looks like for me. I was like, man, I just wish I could do that. So I went back and I was really early. Um, and eventually when I opened my gym, 
I was like, hey, I'm just going to do it like they do it. And I know now many people run gyms very differently. And that's the beauty of the CrossFit community is all these different interpretations and like best practices keep sliding up to the top. But I was like, hey, man, I'll just color by numbers. Like I'm going to teach nine foundational movements. I'm going to teach in the nutrition course, like exactly like that to my members. And so I got all these good ups in a gym just trying to like, hey, good, you know, repetitions one after another. And, uh, and that opened the door for me to be able to join seminar staff. And so, um, so I took that. Um, and was able to, you know, add value there and got introduced to the right people. And then my background in sports was a, a value add to the company back then because Dave and Nicole were primarily running the seminar department. Mm-hmm. Tony was primarily running the media group. Tony Budding. Yeah. Tony Budding, yep. yep. Um, and then there's like, hey, we run the CrossFit Games. And it happens once a year. And like, you know, it was like really early days with that. And I'm like, Hey, I know a, a lot, lot about, about touring sports, especially yeah. scoring systems, broadcast and things like that. So, um, so I was just real fortunate, same, you know, right place, yeah. right time. But after four or five years doing that and education based on that and having owned a gym and being on seminar staff, when they were like, Hey, we've got extra work. I'm like, man, I'll take all the work you got. Yeah. That's and, cool. And correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's an old picture of you judging might be 2008, it's 2009, the 2009 okay. yeah. games, last one at the ranch, Andy yeah. Thor's daughter, Gets her first muscle up. Chuck's, Chuck's a judge, yeah. judging slash yeah. coaching. Yeah. <laughs> but but that goes to show, like, A, you truly can accomplish anything in this world. In 2009, you're judging the CrossFit yeah. Games. 2022, you're running the CrossFit Games. Yeah. And a lot of people like to make excuses in their lives. You know, that's 13 years of, of elbow grease and hard work. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it feels like 33 years. <laughs> <laughs> but, so how long? How long? Because I don't actually remember when you, like, Stop teaching seminars. How long have you been off seminar staff off of that? I've been off seminar staff for exactly seven years. Um, and okay. I was I was doing the... Because I knew when when I came on, you were still there, but it was but very short. Yeah, it was barely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, and the reason I remember is my son Calvin is seven years old. He's okay. my oldest. And um, so I was doing the CrossFit Games as like my full-time job and then also traveling on weekends to do the level one gig. And then I was owning my affiliate remote. And so, um, and I remember when my wife was pregnant being like, you know, you're, you're saying yes to gigs and you're like, okay, so I wonder when that window is when like, I need to start slowing down. Right. And then realizing at that point when, when my wife gave birth, unfortunately everything went great, realizing like, Hey man, like I got to be a dad now. Yeah. And so something's got to give. And for that, it was like gut wrenching to say, Hey, the affiliate, I, I'm doing it remote. They're running right. it by themselves. That's the first thing that needs to go. And then shortly after that, and I, I grappled with this for a while. I was like, hey, I can't wear that shirt. And it wasn't because I couldn't deliver the material. It was because, as you know, like being a flow master, you're also responsible for the improvement of other members on staff. Right. So it's not just can you get the material over, um, but everybody else needs to keep getting better. And I couldn't commit to making other people better that also wore the red shirt. So, um, so I... I've, basically cold turkey i never went back after that so okay. I, I still love those red shirts yeah <laughs> like it's it's one of my proudest uniforms i've ever worn in my life right um and i, I still That's you know, cool. i love it but yeah. it's like at the same time i'm privileged that i got to know that material that deeply because i use that same methodology that same language every single day in my job talking about like you know is this the right technique or you know do we need to slow down so we can speed up later right. so there's so many like beautiful nuggets in that core material um, I mean, that course is just solid gold. So. I tell people all the time, I'm like, there's very few concepts you can't extract from that course and use almost anywhere. Like, yeah. uh, like business, personal life. It's like, just take that concept, use it in whatever fa- fashion you need. And it's, yeah. it works. It works. I don't it care does. what we're talking about. Oh. Yeah. It I'm, works. I'm proof of that. We spoke to Tosh yesterday and he said, you know, he's been on some pretty amazing teams. Yeah. And he was like, he put the red shirts right up there with the best teams he's been on. And such a critical environment. And, and, and I love this because it's good criticism. Hey, you're a little late or, hey, that was the wrong word or, hey, this is a better way to answer that question. But like there was so much like right after the lecture, like the feedback's coming yeah. in. People care so much about making that course excellent every single time. So it's one of those few things where you're like you get ups. And I loved it, too, because in my world, like you don't get a lot of things that have closure. It was awesome. To like put it on. You leave on Friday, you come back on Sunday and you're like, I'm done. Right. Like you just did a good job. Other people now have that information. Right. They get to go take it back to their gyms or their families or their teams and stuff. And I still miss it. That's cool. I mean, you're, so we're at CrossFit or Coda CrossFit and you, so you train here. I do. Yeah. yeah I trained here this morning. So, still in an affiliate. Um, but I want to take that and talk a little bit about sport, right? So like obviously taking the reins of that and you, we were ch- chatting a little bit before, um, kind of expanding that. So kind of what, what's kind of like 
on the horizon for the games and the community affiliates? Because that's where a lot of people have questions. Like, what does this mean for me? Yeah. Well, what it means right now is that we're running the season that we've announced and like baby steps. That's a very good sign. Um, because we made a lot of fast changes over the last three to four years. And so now people, if you ran the season last year inside an affiliate, it's basically the same season this year. Um, so we're going to run three weeks of the Open. The top 10% of athletes will advance on to the quarterfinals. The top athletes from quarterfinals go to in-person semifinals. Mm-hmm. And then the top athletes from there are going to go on to compete at the CrossFit Games, you know, at the big stage. Question um, about that, the, yeah. the format. What was the feedback when you went from five to three? Uh, universe, five weeks to three five weeks. Five weeks to from three five weeks. weeks to three weeks, uh, the feedback almost universally was that that was better for affiliates. And that's why we're doing it that way. As, as an affiliate so owner, better. I was just like, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> as so, an affiliate owner that has no members but does the open, <laughs> three weeks was so much better. <laughs> yeah. And what I also like about that is it allowed us to kind of honor the entry stage to this. But also it really gives that kind of achievable threshold of, hey, being in the top 10% worldwide, or if you're an affiliate cup team being in the top 25%, man, that's, that's approachable, Mm -hmm. you know, like, Hey, you can actually gun for that. And what we saw, even when I was in Santa Cruz and other places, people are like, Hey, if you're not a a regional guy Mm -hmm. or woman, um, man, it's not for me. Right. And now you're like, Hey, top 10%, like that is an honored designation to be in the top 10% worldwide. And there's no cap to that. 10% is, is relative to the overall size of the group. So that could just keep going. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, and by the way, the more people, the stiffer the competition gets, it makes it harder. But, but I think that's part of, you know, what I love about what we're doing is saying, Hey, it's not just for the people that are, you know, just gifted, you know, and hardworking and disciplined and skilled and stuff. But, you know, some people are just different. Mm -hmm. Um, But also that top 10%, you can earn your way into that. You know, ordinary people can be a top 10% or ordinary affiliates can get a team into the top 25%. So I really like that notion of like, hey, it's aggressive, but achievable. We talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. And I love that we can expand that in the future going forward, that below that top 10%, we should still create more opportunities for people to responsibly compete in person. And I'm really excited about the growth that we can have there with both licensed competitions that we'll partner with that other people will run and also more virtual competitions for people at all levels. Yeah, and you've seen a lot of, the, like, Rogue does a lot of the kind of, like, virtual, like, one event stuff, which yeah. I think is really cool. Um, and it, so there's obviously been a lot of change over the past, f- call it four or five years with regard to formats. It went regionals and then it was yeah. sanctionals. Obviously, we'll remove COVID from the, from the equation, but then... Um, so there's that single track, right? Open, you qualify out of there, that narrows down, we go to the games. Um, but talk a little bit about like these, the, cause that's a question people have, like, what are, what are these co part these partnerships with these events? Like that are licensed, like what are those about and who are they for? So licensed competitions, I'm going to zoom back and okay. do the little history lesson. Yep. So when we uh, originally, that was all there was were licensed CrossFit competitions, and then CrossFit ran one. Right. And those were the events that took place on the ranch in Aromas, California. So you had like Granite Games, Wadapalooza, Dubai. Way, way, way back. Like at the beginning of this, you're like, like when I started CrossFit in 2006, I got in pretty good shape mm-hmm. and then go, well, what do people do who are fit that like to compete? Right. And there were no CrossFit games. So I bought a tri bike and I raced a triathlon series. I'm like, right. I guess that's what the fit people do is you should go do something else. Um, the following year, 2007 was the inaugural CrossFit games. Mm-hmm. And it was like, wow, like this is how you would test fitness, not just use fitness to train for another sport. And then the next year there was play in events. No, sorry. The next year was a sign up event. So 2008 mm-hmm. was also like, Hey, if you just got your money in first, you right. can reserve a spot. Every right. second counts. Every second yep. counts. Yeah. The following year, 2009, was really interesting because there was so much demand where people are like, hey, I, like the games isn't enough. You need more spots. More mm-hmm. people want to take the floor. And so that expanded to all these small partner-run events. And they some people like in uh, That was Washington, originally regionals, right? Th- that they, was the old regionals, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so somebody would be like, hey, it's two days of workouts. Another event in Texas would say it's three days of workouts. You know, hell's half, a- half acre. Um, in <laughs> Europe, they'd say, hey, we're running a one-day competition mm-hmm. or a three-day competition. So there's a lot of variance in that. Right. And then CrossFit said, hey, just send us your best athletes. And then we'll, we'll test them at the finals. And that was 2009 where, where I got to judge. Um, and then in 2010, the demand again was there where people are like, hey, there's not enough spots at the regionals. You need another layer. Let's have play in events so to the regionals. Sectionals. sectionals. That was sectionals. Yep. Yeah, the, the naming conventions yep. here get a little weird. <laughs> but there were sectionals that fed into regionals, and all of those were partner run events. In 2011, something big happened, and we launched the CrossFit Games Open. 
And the intent behind the open was to have a single stage that anybody with 20 bucks and an internet connection could go participate in. First so if you were some person, yeah, you didn't. double under, right? What's that? The snatch double under workout? I think it was, yeah. There was a terrible, yeah. was Went it for six, about five weeks. Six yeah. minutes of it was uh, squat clean and jerks, yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. All from Tony right. Budding's basement oh. where he was like, you know, doing the original briefs and stuff. Oh. Like, we've come a long way. Uh, but also a lot of people, like, they laid the foundation. Mm -hmm. Guys like, you know, Tony and others. Um, but as we went forward with that, what the Open did was said, there will be a more uniform test. Yeah, because so that was the will beef. program the Open. And CrossFit will program the finals. And then it was like, oh, yeah, well, we ought to just go ahead and do the middle stage, too, right. to keep it consistent. Well, taking that meant that CrossFit ended up shouldering the burden of running 17 events around the world, like Seoul, Korea, mm -hmm. Cape Town, South Africa, right. like all over. So it was really rough. But we took that on. CrossFit paid for all those competitions. But what we were doing was saying, hey, CrossFit competitions are the ones that CrossFit runs. And then there was other competitions like Wadapalooza. Mm -hmm. Uh, these other competitions are taking place in the Northwest and outside the United States. They were starting to grow up. And they're like, hey, we'd love to be part of this system. We'd at least like to call it CrossFit. And our original position back there was, we're not controlling it. It's not the CrossFit game. So, so no, like the name is reserved for affiliate owners and the name's reserved for this competition. Flash forward to 2022, I think we're much more open to saying, hey, if this is a competition where people that do CrossFit go and compete, and it's serving local community, mm -hmm. um, and it's you know it's all kind of part of the same ecosystem. Let's just call it what it is. It's a CrossFit event. It's a licensed event. It's not right. owned and operated by CrossFit. But how do we partner with those guys and add value? And it's part of my job now going forward. Athletes are an important group. Event organizers are a really important group. Events suck. What? Events if they're hard suck. to run. Yeah. And I think that's part of the. Hey, and you know that's it's a little bit like the affiliate model where people go, hey, it's not an easy business to run. No. And I think there's been a lot of new education. You know, CrossFit's been involved with this. There's a lot of other people that are involved with bringing better education, better best practices in. But it's not an easy business to run. It's a good business. It can be a very good business in terms of like, you know, finances and stuff like that. But it takes a lot of work. It's And hard. you got to be really dug in. So I think when I take that out, that same model I look at and I say, hey, affiliates have figured it out by and large. Like there are models out there that you can look at the event space hasn't quite figured it out. There's a couple people that have unique circumstances. Um, and there's a couple people who have great event operating backgrounds. We can do a lot to help that class of events really take it to another level. And that makes better spectator experiences, that makes better athlete experiences. It also creates more approachable touch points where people are like, hey, I know I'm not gonna get the semifinals, but I wanna train really hard. I wanna go to this local competition that's like right for me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to, do that in a way where it partners with, you know, the Open and CrossFit and helping us kind of determine like, hey, what level is responsible for you to participate at? And then also go to the event side and say, hey, guys, program responsibly for the athletes that you're going to oh get. It's yeah. the scaling thing yeah. all over again. Like it should be the right intensity for that population. And so if you're in the top 10% and you're a quarterfinal athlete, hey, maybe that's going to be a really stiff competition with a bunch of workouts and tough loading and more difficult skills and stuff like that. But man, if it's just an RX event, you don't need 10 events. You know, no. like you want to, we want responsible competition where you're uh, honoring the athletes, giving them a great experience, but then also returning them back to an affiliate motivated to train for the next one. So and I think that supports hopefully the coaching and the affiliate side. And that, so that's where I was going to go with that is obviously affiliate owners are like, oh, what's in it for me, right? So with regard to your job as a GM of a sport, what do you, or do you see your, uh, as your either as a participant in the growth of CrossFit or how does that aid affiliates, right? Because that's what, that's what affiliate owners are worried about. Okay, the CrossFit game is awesome, but I'm not really sure what that does for me. Yeah, well, I, I'll build it maybe from the ground up, which is first, I don't think everybody's motivated by competition, but some people are. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've got to get into a richer conversation where it's not like it's one size fits all. Like for me, I played college baseball. Right. I happen to be competitive. That drew me into a CrossFit gym that I felt like I was training for a sport. And when I got to a level of like decent fitness, I was like, what do I do? I'm bouncing off the walls. I'm right. like triathlon series. Like I would love to go and participate at local events back then. Not, not now. Not now. <laughs> I'm all set. Yeah. I'm good right yeah. here and doing the open. Um, but I think what, what I think we can add value to is saying, Hey, there should be approachable kind of training goals. And so whether that's, you know, like a benchmark that you're training for, it's a skill set that you want to have. So you just feel proud that you've got it or it's a local competition. And I think competitions are unique in that they take the ordinary things and they make them extraordinary. So it's still just like three or four workouts. So like you could do that in your gym on the weekend, but when you go and you step onto the floor 
and you do it in front of other people, like it makes it extra. It's more memorable. It has more meaning. Oh, and we so- just did one um, in October with just four events one day, nothing crazy. Yeah. We programmed them in-house, but people love it. Yeah. And as long as you don't program it like an asshole, then it's fine. Well, there you go. And yeah. I think we can help uh, be an, uh, a part of that system to say like, hey, how do we do this better? Right. And then honor the athletes, but also, you know, we need to create more opportunities for event organizers. But I think that's what I love about the Open is the Open gives like a really accessible touch point to that. And that's why I think it's so cool when people sign up for the Open, you're officially an athlete in our sport when you sign up. Mm-hmm. And that's different than saying like, oh yeah, I'll see what the workout is and maybe I'll sign right. up. Or you know what, like I'll do it, but I'm not going to keep my score on the leaderboard. Right. That's not the same. You know, like that's like shooting hoops as opposed to like signing up for the tournament. Right. And so this is cool that I think it can motivate people to get in there and say, like, I know my fitness is better because I'm training knowing that there's going to be a tough test on February 24th when we announced the first workout and I want to be ready for it. Yeah. And I want to be like, Hey, you know, I'm taking the test, but my fitness over the next, you know, four weeks or so is like, I know what I'm training for. Yeah. And so I think that's an accessible games or competition aided experience that I think affiliates hopefully can lean into, which is I I will be more fit because I'm training with more intensity and purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not bad. Well, and it's to no coincidence, we've been saying all week long, we've been dropping into affiliates, we're working out harder than we yeah. do by ourselves. Yeah. And the open is kind of like that feeling on steroids. Like if you show up to your affiliate and do a 10 by 2 back squat, you're going to go heavier than your garage. Now, yeah. if it happens to be on a Friday night when you have a judge next to you, you're going to go even heavier. And every year, every affiliate experiences those people that get their first muscle up, handstand push up or handstand walk, whatever that is, yeah. PR is their snatch. You wouldn't do that in a typical class. As much as that yeah. brings out more in you, it's, it's, it, although it's only the open at your affiliate, it's a competition. It and is. you step up. And, and like, let's be honest, like that's heroic for people. You know, most people don't like showing up and being that vulnerable in front of a group of others. And so there's something about doing it in your class. Like I did it today at 6.30 a.m. There's something more elevated about doing it hey, on Friday at night in front of my like bigger right. gym with community. Judge, Everybody right? with a judge and like with tough standards Score and things card, like that, yeah. all that. Um, so you get an approachable dose. And so, so I think that hopefully benefits, you know, it gives something consistent to train for. The other thing is literally signing up for the open is the thing that fuels our being able to live stream the regionals, being able to live stream the games free to everybody everywhere. Um, being able to broadcast the CrossFit Games on television in the United States and outside the United mm-hmm. States. You know, so like all of those things kind of come from this incredible patronage also of people who sign up and participate. And I think we're excited about leaning more into media and storytelling, not just for the elite athletes, but also a lot of these athletes have really surprisingly ordinary stories. Like I walked into a gym and I didn't realize it. I was pretty athletic, and then it went well. Or I wasn't, or I wasn't pretty athletic. <laughs> right. Like, a lot of people are like, hey, I had no idea, but I thought I'd give it a try. And I think that's where, you know, if, if we really do this well as a community, athletes, event organizers, affiliates, and trainers together, what I think this looks like is that some of these remarkable athletes that, you know, like Annie Thor's daughters in, like, you know, Vogue magazine or something like that, she started as this young woman. Couldn't do a muscle-up. Who couldn't do a muscle-up, who came came back to Iceland, lit her country on fire, and then also became a member of seminar staff. Right. And also opened an affiliate. affiliate. So like you start seeing and then had a baby and is still fitter than all of us. us. Yeah. 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 And stronger. Yeah. I mean that was to me, I've said that before, the most impressive performance last year. Two remain and between them they have six CrossFit Games championships. Annie Thoris on her up first at two hundred. She can get that. She Plenty can get that. Plenty of time is left. Plenty Just of time. 15 seconds left here. You only have to start at 29. Now, like Laura Horvath, you need a little extra at the top, but you got to be ready for that bar at the bottom. Second attempt for Thorsar. There it is. And Andy Thorsar has it. <laughs> that is. Priceless. Eddie Thorson was in a state of shock right now.
She is so, and, and when you look back, it's not a surprise to me that some of the greatest ambassadors that we've had have been ones that have the like level one methodology nailed. You know, like they wore that shirt also right. and they taught others. They also have the affiliate background. So they understand how CrossFit transforms other people's lives. And they understand how disciplined and hardworking you have to be in order to compete at the highest level. And not just highest level once, but like Annie's done it how many years? year over Ten year years over almost? year. And then through all these different yeah. seasons of her life. Um, man, they really get all the different facets. Yeah. And what they see is the intersection of all those facets rather than the division of right. those things. Like, no, it's either athlete or it's health. You're like, no, it's not, man. You know, like, and I, and I love that. And I think we're excited to unpack more of those stories. The like ordinary athletes that walked into a gym, you're like, hey, I used to work in an ice cream shop. Mm -hmm. And I walked in here and I was like, oh, this seems okay. I've never really been a stick and ball sport mm -hmm. athlete. I've never been a great runner, but I was kind of good at all these other things. Right. I've been strong. And you're like, okay, well here, let's see what her story is. And then now she becomes this superhero. Yeah. Um, so I think we can tell those stories better. And, you know, ultimately... The goal is that, like a little motivation, a little inspiration, but also always drawing a line back to they come from gyms and they're well coached. That's where I was going to go with that is that the origin story starts here. Yeah. Right. Like that's that's what if affiliates are like, what's in it for me? And I'm like, well, that origin story, they all start here without these. Nothing. Yeah. None of this works without affiliates. The game doesn't exist like none of it. Yeah. It starts in their box. And like whether you send somebody to the games or not. The story's the same. It just it maybe doesn't go as far, but yeah. it's just like they get they get off of medication, or they can play with their grandkids, or yeah. I've got a seven year old woman in my gym, Christina, who deadlifted 155 pounds, and I'm like, she's not going to the games, but that is amazing. Yeah, well, she might go to the games. Well, that's true too. Yeah, yeah, like, that's true too. So, so let us ask you a few questions as you know, relative to the games this year that have changed. Put you on the spot a little bit. Who's doing the programming for the open and the games this year? We're we're gonna get into the programming conversation soon. You want me uh, to do it? What? <laughs> Handstand push-ups and back squats. So this is awkward because we're still there negotiating. <laughs> I was like, yeah, the power play right there. It's going to be very limited, yeah. limited lane of yeah. movement. 10 by 2 back squat three weeks in a row. Yeah. What's going on? Uh, it's not Jason Ackerman. Yeah, <laughs> thank God. Yeah. But I'll say this. Uh, the people that we're going to lean into for the programming will be people who are steeped in CrossFit methodology. So they're going to have to have deep knowledge like a red shirt does or be a red shirt themselves. So I hit the first category <laughs> qualifier so far. Also have to be, you know, free, no conflicts of interest. Yeah. You know, so, and we've heard this from athletes. Right. We've heard this from other camps. It's like, hey, you know, if they have, you know, side programming, things like that, we respect that. And I think there's a lot of good training that's taking place there. But when you're programming the games, that can't that's, happen yeah, no. to two preserve the integrity. Two for two. <laughs> and I will sit out this year as the programmer because yeah. I do find that unfair. The third, and we'll see if you can yeah, nail this one. The third is you really have to understand the science and the magnitude of programming large competitions like the CrossFit Games. Science and so there's okay. so many more yeah, right. facets than just like, hey, is this a good test of fitness? Yes, right. they have to be. Second, is this a story that people understand? Does it have the balance of you know energy pathways, time domains, skills and drills, equipment, loading? And then balancing that with the production aspect. Of and it. then balancing that with like just the pragmatic, like how do you get them on and off the floor? Right. How do you test that appropriately? How do you program in 3D space? How do you integrate a story? story that media can capture and take through a camera. Um, so there's so much that goes into that. That's the, it's this rich portrait. Um, you know, Dave's been an extraordinarily good programmer, but I think it's because he has a lot of that experience. Right. And then also like, because he, you know, he and Nicole started the seminar department. So they were like the closest to that material mm -hmm. along with Tony Budding. Um, so I think that's kind of the root, like that's where it starts. The core to extremity is like, you got to understand what we're testing for. You have to understand what fitness is. And then also the last thing, I guess the fourth component is you have to have courage you know, to stand by these decisions, uh, to drive athletes forward. And the games is an unbound test. The finals, when you get there, that is not going to be a, well, here's the boundaries, right. here's, the, here's the maximums and the minimums and stuff. This is a test that the whole world looks at. And you go, hey, man, no human being is fitter than that person. Right. And you also have to command their attention. You're like, man, I want to watch that because that is impressive. Right. It's not just the fittest of 40 people. And um, it's not just like, hey, they're good at CrossFit. It's yeah. just like, hey, we're going to stretch you way outside that. Sure. You know, and that's what I think has been cool Running, about the games. Is, swimming. Yeah, just stuff they're like, that's, that's not what we would typically see. Actually, that's never what we would see in affiliate. Yeah. But they're crushing that that test yeah and we know they don't technically train because i have shit half of some of them they don't even know and then but you take that the magnitude and the scale of that that kind of profound expression of how do you test fitness what is fitness how do you know and then you walk it all the way back down every stage beneath that is a different population mm -hmm. at the semifinals you don't need to have 12 to 15 different tests right 
you need a smaller range, but it's got a different job. You want to get them to the games. Mm -hmm. At the quarterfinals, it's a virtual competition. It's not an in-person competition, but hey, what do we need to know from these athletes to qualify them to go to in-person competition? And then you get back down to the open, and it's some well-rounded tests that the fittest athletes are going to fly through. Right. But the ordinary people are going to be like, man, but I can do this. And you know, it can it, happen in an affiliate. It can happen in an affiliate. And if it's not RX, they say, I can scale it, preserve that stimulus. And then there's this common shared element of like, man, I pushed it hard. I feel good about this. I'm proud of my accomplishment. Mm. Even though I don't move on to the top 10% or I don't right. move on to semifinals. I'm like, man, I'm proud of what I did. And I did it literally alongside Annie Thor's daughter at CrossFit Reykjavik, or I did it alongside Rich Froning at CrossFit Mayhem, mm -hmm. or I did it alongside... Jason Ackerman, best Jason Ackerman in his garage. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, I don't say anything if I'm right. I'm going to make a prediction. Adrian Bosman. I mean, program that would be... Don't would say anything if I'm right. <laughs> Wait, All right. <laughs> it's like, shit, I don't know. This is a trick question. That's my, I just want to put it out there. That, that's my guess. I have no inside knowledge. Justin did not say anything to me. Um, second part of that, who will be doing the announcements? Uh, that part I'm excited about, um, that's going to be part of the ordinary drama of the open announcements. Um, somebody asked me, like, hey, is it going to be boring, you know? Uh, Very boring. The, the, yeah, it's going to be really boring. I go, man, it can't be boring as long as the workouts are unknown. Like, that's such an unbelievably cool part of our sport. Yeah. Like, when I, t so I talk to people that are involved with rodeo, that are involved with baseball, or, like, you know, all kinds of different, like, triathlon. And when I explain to them what they do, they're like, oh, like, that's different. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, if you're in basketball, like, the hoops don't change. There's right. no announcement about, like, hey, we're, we're yeah. playing on the 12-foot goals this we're, year. We're playing two halves. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. We shoot on these you know, ends. That's it. Yeah. Um, but, but the key to those is when those things don't change, the gamesmanship and the athletes step forward. I think in our sport, we still want the athletes to be more forward in that and be the ambassadors of our sport. That's the way it should be. Um, but at the same time, there will be because there are these reveals that brings people in, you know, like, so those open announcement shows yeah, are mysterious. special. Yeah. A couple hundred thousand people around the world tune in to watch what these workouts are like, that's cool. We want to honor the moment, make it exciting. Um, and also I love that, you know, the reason we're doing it is not just to be dramatic. It's because our fitness prescription CrossFit says that you should be prepared for the unknown and the unknowable. So we don't publish these workouts six months ago and say, Hey, everybody get ready for these specific workouts. It's like, hey, man, we don't know what it is. So you have to study broadly. Imagine, like, it's like law school right. or like fire service or something. Like, I don't know exactly what today is going to look like, but I know I'm generally prepared. Mm -hmm. And so when you train generally, you get that broad adaptation that changes members' lives. And then you give a couple specific tests and you go, okay, go for it. And by the way, the best coached athletes in the gyms that contribute the most to it tend to do the best. You know, they're Not like, they're well prepared. Yeah. Not they're training CrossFit, right? And there's a CrossFit opportunity presented in the open for them to go take the test. Very cool. I would say Fern would be good at that, but one thing that needs to improve: penmanship, yeah. handwriting, yeah. handwriting in the open announcements. Well, I don't think okay. that's been a part of it thus far up to this point. Like, I don't know if I'd give Some, Dave a, an A plus on his handwriting. No, I'm <laughs> saying he would not, and I'm <laughs> saying this year we can make that improve, and we can yeah. have a little bit better penmanship at the whiteboard. We'll, we'll, we'll see. see. We'll it, it'll, it'll be a different look, but I think, you know, what Dave's built, um, I'm honored to continue. This team feels really honored that we have something that we can continue to build. Um, and I think what I'm looking forward to the most is how do we take those pieces? When we do things consistently this year, that's a signal. When things change, that'll be a little bit of a signal. Um, but we have so much to work with, um, and we're so proud, the whole team is, that like with athletes and event organizers, affiliates, like everybody kind of bought in. We as a big group have built this thing together. No one else, this isn't like an off the shelf. It's not like how baseball did it or how NASCAR did it or how you know track and field does it. Like we're building something ourselves. And that fierce independence is something that I think we really care about. We want to preserve that, but also we want to, you know, take some of the best practices from other places and bring it in as well. That's been a CrossFit thing all the time. Yeah. You know, like, hey, if that's a better technique, hey, bring it in. Bring Let's it make in. it part of it. So we well, say one change weekend. you guys did make is announcement times are moved up, right? We did. Yeah, what we're going to. They? Uh, they're they're going to be twelve o'clock Pacific time. So okay. And so that's a significant time, shift. Three, three yeah. Eastern. Yeah. So you yeah. can you can stream it at work if you're in North America, and we get to bring all of our European friends into this with us as well. And that was one of the big bummers with doing it late in the day was that if you were in Europe, you were catching the announcement 
the next day. And then you're like, at that point, like the joke or the punchline or the, you know, the announcement is out and you're like, oh, you're not hearing about it live. Right. So we wanted to slide it forward. And we started this last year so that we can welcome in more European athletes in, in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, so that they feel part of that and they get a, a little extra time to prepare as well. Yeah, I mean, even I'm on the East Coast, and even then, like when they were doing a little bit later, yeah, I was like, man, late. I'm like 8 p.m. I'm like, oh, God, I'm like trying to put the kids to bed. 20 yeah. foot lanes. Yeah, I, I got to be there at midnight, yeah. like organizing the gym, printing all this stuff out. So I, I think that's uh, also, a, and as, as exciting as it was, that there were obvious pain points there. So I like yeah. that's a good change, I think. Hey, can I ask you two real questions that you may or may not like? Okay. Cool. And we're doing them at the end here. We can clip this. Okay. <laughs> but I, you know, only because if we don't say these things, we'll get it. And, and, and I know what I believe. Monster energy. What would you say about that? The, the way I view monster energy is, you know, there's the fourth group that I'm kind of talking about here. So athletes are really important to me. Event organizers are important. Affiliates are really important. Uh, but also our partners are important to this. Because, you know, if you look at the patronage of our sport over time, like Greg was the single largest patron that our sports ever had. You know, so there's many years that the CrossFit Games were not profitable um, and that Greg subsidized that, you know, and it was, he allowed that to take place. So he, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of the way that he treated sport, but man, you know, how long do you want that to persist? Right. Um, when you look at the way our sport is going to grow going forward, I think there's two things. One, you have to really believe that CrossFit as a methodology works and that the truth that happens in affiliates is working. Um, and that when there are people that come in from outside, like there's lots of different sponsors that have different things to offer. They support and contribute in different ways. And CrossFit doesn't pass a ton of judgment on that stuff. Um, when you look at what Monster is doing, they're sponsoring athletes, they're sponsoring events, and that's going to create more opportunity for athletes. What they've told us is really important. And they're helping a lot of event organizers. And so they're helping them run competitions. And a lot, like you said, that's a rough business to be in. So we don't kind of cast judgment on, you know, another partner coming in and saying, hey, we want to compete or sorry, we want to support the sport. Mm-hmm. What we're not doing is saying like, hey, Monster, you know, like, hey, we're, we're drilling down into affiliates. We're not getting, you know, there, a lot of partners are not involved in our education material and stuff. That's kind of like holy territory, like the level one and level two. I think that's never the concern be that people that. have. They're like, hey, well, yeah. Coke owns Monster and like, we know how this has gone for the past 10 years. Like, is this the beginning of the end with regard to, you know, letting some of these people in the space. Yeah, I mean, when you look at it, um, you know, Camille leblanc Bazinet had Red Bull as a sponsor. Um, I think what, um, what Monster is doing now is they're building actually a much larger athlete portfolio, and I don't think that's bad. I think that's net good. And here's why I believe it. They're trying to amplify people who I think are terrific ambassadors for our sport. Those athletes are going to go out, and they're going to introduce CrossFit at some level to new people. And you know who the beneficiary of that affiliate is? Owners. Affiliate, affiliate owners. owners. Because yeah. when people saw, like when Annie Thor's daughter did that, you know who walked into the doors of her gym? Catherine David's daughter. You know who else walked into her do- gym? All these other people that right. you've never heard of. Yeah, the 50, that are all fitter because yeah, of that. 1,500 yeah. members yeah. of yeah. Shadows. Or and so right. when people want to help us shine a brighter spotlight on athletes or on these events or on our competitions, um, you know, I think we've got to be smart about it. But I, I think there's a welcome place for that. I think affiliate owners, well, maybe get a little hate about this. I think affiliate owners complaining about that is analogous to members complaining about programming. Like, you're not seeing the big picture. Well, I think, I think there's more well, and, to and it. And here's the other deal. You don't have to agree. And like, I think that's okay. Like, CrossFit is not about, hey, we all have to have a consensus opinion on this one thing. Like, that's fair. Like, we get challenged on things. We defend things. We go forward. And I think we learn and we go forward. But, but I do think that there's a, a broader picture. And, like, right now, the picture that most people don't see is events are a rough business. If people want to go play at these events, there needs to be patrons of those things. Somebody has to foot the bill. You can't continue to ask affiliate owners to lose money to produce a competition and then walk home with, like, a couple extra barbells. Like, right. if we want more sustainable competitions and better competitions, better program competitions, then we're going to have to let people support those competitions. Yeah, and I think there's a, I, I think it's a little bit more of a nuanced conversation, right? Which is like, we're not saying monster's good for you, right? Well, we're like, saying their money sugar. is. Their money well, is. Well, but I mean, if, yeah. if it lends itself to something, I think you can, I think you can have, I think you can hold two beliefs at the same time, which is like this brings value to the sport and sport is different than health in many ways. Yeah. Right. But also not, we're like, we're not saying that like sugar's good for you. Like that's not the message and that's no. not going to be in the nutrition lecture moving forward. No, it's <laughs> not like for sure not like that's the, especially for people that have worked inside CrossFit and they've been on seminar staff. Like it's a silly proposition 
that there would be like a, hey, and now it's going to end up being taught or something like that. Like not a chance. <clears throat> but I think that's right. Is, is the idea behind this is like it's not one thing. CrossFit is not one size fits all. That's the beauty of the affiliate community is there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different interpretations. These micro gyms that get to make their own decisions and you get to make your own decision with that. At the competition level, hey, we make decisions. At a you know, licensed event level, they make decisions. As an individual athlete, they make decisions. The broad result of this is more people are seeing CrossFit. And if you believe that CrossFit is pure and good and it transforms people's lives, that's not a bad thing. So I'm not going to be required to buy a monster and sell it to my members? <laughs> Just shotgun a monster to, before yeah. they open. Yeah, Tool, but it, let's really be honest. Right. The same people complaining are drinking other energy drinks. Yeah, they're probably they're, monsters they're, themselves, bangs, right? Yeah. I know I have on road trips. Like you stop at a gas station. So let's not uh, – there's some quote about judging in there. I'm not going to ask the other question. I know you got to go. I'll ask one last question. Okay. I'm signed up for the open. You're signed up for the sense. open. Yeah. I'm not going to ask the question I was going to ask. Okay, got it. If you had to guess, who's going to place higher in the Open this year, Justin? Well, how come I don't get to be a part of this? He, oh, no. You know what? We, have an, we now have a three-man leaderboard. Right three-man three leaderboard. Man leaderboard. Right. Yeah, I don't want to be a part of that. <laughs> uh, who's going to do better in the Open? Ferner Ackerman, right here. You have to make a prediction. Are you guys both signed up? I'm signed up. Yes. Well, I just... Actually... I know I registered he's my affiliate. <laughs> I was like, I know I registered my affiliate, I but now... I don't, I he's know registered. I think I he's going to I registered win. my affiliate, but now I'm like, did I register? Yeah. That, I was, the I was, yeah, yeah. that yeah. was the correct answer. I, have but not, I, don't, I, I am and, registered. And, I mean, I might be the only affiliate on the planet with 100% membership registration in the CrossFit Open. I'm getting rid of Roz. Yep. She's not coming <laughs> to the box for those three right. weeks. I'm in. Fair but enough. But I, I think that was the best answer you gave on the, the show. Ackerman's going to win. I'm excited for this year, Justin. You know, we know you pretty well. For those that haven't seen him, we're in good hands. We're in good hands Thanks this year, and, we, and we, we appreciate it. We're looking forward to it. It's going to be a great experience. And guess what? The fittest will win. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? What's no. That? Thanks cool. for having me, guys. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, Justin. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Best Hour of Their Day podcast. We appreciate you listening and choosing to have us help you in your passion for coaching and affiliate ownership. You can find more episodes just like this on all podcast platforms. If you're interested in learning more, you can reach out to us on any social media platforms, or you can visit www.besthouroftheirday.com to book a call. If you found this episode helpful for you, please share it so that we can help other coaches and affiliate owners to help build a bigger and stronger CrossFit community. Thanks for listening.